Good morning and welcome to Irvine United Congregational Church on this first Sunday of Lent. IUCC is a proudly progressive congregation of the United Church of Christ. We are an open and affirming just peace, creation, justice, global missions church, which means we are committed to working for justice in our world with an intentional welcome to the LGBT community as we live out an action-oriented faith that encourages us to ask questions, think critically, delve deeply, and live out the commitment to love one another. If it's your first time, I want to thank you for joining us. I know you have so many opportunities to worship these days online, but we're so glad that you're here. You can find out more about who we are as a progressive Christian church here in Orange County, but sending out the good news around the world by going to our website. And if you go to iucc.org slash visitor, you can tell us a little bit more about yourself so we can reach back out to you. All of us can do our part in sharing the good news by simply pushing share on our Facebook posts. Um, even those of you who are on our website can share with your friends and family by sending the link to our website to those folks. We know that truly it is when people make those personal connections and invite others that they actually come. So many people do find us, of course, through our website by Googling Progressive Church. So when you're sharing, you're helping not only to invite your friends and your family, making those personal recommendations, but you're helping our Google Analytics go up so others can find us as well. Thank you for joining us. While this is the first Sunday of Lent, the season of Lent began a few days ago on Ash Wednesday. I had the opportunity to observe with so many of you, either by seeing you at your home and imparting the ashes or meeting you here at our home here at IUCC in our parking lot, or of course right here in our sanctuary where we shared our service online. If you missed it, you can still watch it. You can go either to our Facebook page or, or look in our uh, website in order to experience it once again or for the first time as you embark upon this Lenten journey. Together, we recognize our own mortality. We find space to celebrate this gift of life. And as I've already experienced this year, it seems all the more poignant. With the beginning of Lent comes a new opportunity to connect, one that seeks to address the disconnect of the pandemic through caring connections. We're going to engage the themes that we lift up on Sundays to begin our conversations together. You don't have to commit to the whole season. Just drop in any Wednesday at 4 p.m. and connect with us. So welcome to this season of Lent as we journey inside. We'll talk more about what that means as the season unfolds, but we can visualize that together in the symbol of a labyrinth and the act of walking it. A labyrinth is not a maze. It follows a path, circling its way inward, inviting us to the same, step by step, thought by thought, prayer by prayer. One doesn't walk the labyrinth in a hurry, but takes time, as long as it takes, to go inside and come back out. So let's use the symbol of the labyrinth to journey inside together and individually. 
I have this finger labyrinth that I can use to quiet my mind and focus my thoughts. I want to offer you the same so you can download it with our bulletin and simply take your finger either by printing it out or you can even do it on your phone. Uh, follow along as you intentionally enter into this quiet space calmly, allowing your mind to simply go where your finger goes towards the center of the labyrinth and then spiral your way back out. But I also have a special opportunity to offer you as you journey inside to your inner sanctuary, you can sign up to walk the labyrinth here in our sanctuary. Robin Marie McClement has graciously offered to share and set up a labyrinth right here. For safety, you're going to need to come one at a time or by household. So we're going to need you to sign up or at least let us know ahead of time. You can either do that by emailing us at iucc at iucc.org or call the church at 949-733-0220 to sign up for a time slot anytime between 10 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. Monday through Thursday throughout the season of Lent. And so, my friends, let us journey inside together as the Lenten journey begins. We are a wilderness wandering people on a journey of the soul. May we find our destination in our longing to behold our holy God is called Jesus by our side, may compassion be our compass, may the Spirit be our guide, we belong, we belong, we belong. The journey begins into the wilderness we make our way. Asking the questions that lead us more fully to you. Looking within, we seek to more fully understand ourselves, looking for the divine in us, fully aware of our inability to fully know you. Still, we come with a mere intention to try. Starting with the mystery and ending there too. The journey begins, our eyes held fast to the cross. Sojourners, Sojourners of faith, faith we, we take, take our first steps, first steps into, into our, our journey, journey inside. inside. Bless now, O oh God, the journey that all your people make. The path through noise and silence, the way of give and take. The trail is found in desert and winds the mountain round, then leads beside still Wait for 
Jesus, aren't you the Holy One out here praying and not eating? How long has it been? 40 days? You must be hungry. Like, really hungry. If you are really the Son of God, why don't you take these stones and turn them into bread so you can eat? Man? can't live on bread alone, but on God's word. Okay, you're not taking me seriously. I transported you to the top of this temple. You really are the son of God, jump. For it is written, the angels will come and save you before you hit the ground. It is written, do not test God. You can see the kingdoms from here, right? Isn't it stunning? It's beautiful, it's glorious, and I'm willing to give it to you. But on one condition, you must worship me. For it is written, you should only worship God. go, but you haven't seen the last of me.
Ash Wednesday invited us to face our own mortality. As we recognize this year, the ashes have never been far from us. We are so aware of death, illness, and suffering in our world. We pray for the over 2 million people worldwide who have died from the coronavirus and the now 500,000 American families who grieve the death of a loved one due to COVID-19. The number is almost <laughs> unimaginable, and yet as we say every week, none of us is unaffected. All of us are worried or grieving or loving someone who has been infected. And so as we enter into this time of prayer, we will lift up the names that we know and imagine those we don't as we embark in this safe space together. You can do so by writing names in the comments or saying the names out loud to our God, and we'll share in this space and then conclude our prayer by saying Jesus' prayer together. Let us pray. God of life and death, journeying with us from birth to death, inviting us deeper into relationship with you. We journey inside to find you in us, ever-present, ever-loving. We quiet our minds and we open our hearts and we pause to listen, to encounter, to experience you, Emmanuel, God with us. We recognize our own mortality in ways perhaps we hadn't before, and yet we also know that your divinity is in us. And so we hold to both along this journey, ever aware of these tensions we carry, joy and sorrow, heartache, elation, hope, and sometimes helplessness. We hold it all, and we lift it to you. Holy One, hear the prayers of your people. For Daniel Blackburn's parent, grandparents, Barbara Carse's cousin Kim, David Cottle, Hallie Cespedes Corinne's husband Javier, Judy Curry, her family, and her husband Mike, Alyssa Cornett's parents and her grandmother, Grace, Ellery Einstein, the family and friends who mourn Sandra Fox, Worth Giller, the family and friends of John Habash's friend, Joe, and his grieving wife, Veronica, Linda and Chuck Heath's neighbors, Mark's son, Andy, Joan Henderson, Terry and Eric Houston, Janice Johnson, Jen Lofstrom and her mother, Sharon Lynn's friend Nan, Jen Mermack's cousin Amy, Cheryl Moore, Mary and Craig Rep's daughter Anna, Marjorie Robertson's brother Sean, Ruth Sandberg's sister-in-law Mary and her sons David and Eric, Susan Sayre's sister Patty, David Schofield's friend Kate, Marilyn Smith, Jean Stewart's sister, Carol, Jeff Struckhart's sister-in-law, Kay, Todd Thompson, Dale Vaughn, Jan Wilson. You hear our prayers, both spoken and unspoken. You know the depths of our souls. And so it is that we pray for those that we know and those that we don't particularly holding all those across our country dealing with freezing weather and too many who have suffered this week without power. We are mindful of all the pain in this world. So we lift it all to you, knowing that you are always with us, offering us a peace that passes our understanding even as our hearts break. Lead us ever on this path to peace, to walk in the ways of Jesus, to experience your healing and to reflect that healing love that Jesus 
radiated out into our world. We pray his prayer as we seek to follow in his footsteps. Our creator, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so it is that we put our prayers into action, that we give of ourselves to be church. So I invite you this morning to consider the ways you can give of yourself. You can certainly give by writing a check to IUCC and sending it to 4915 Alton Parkway here in Irvine, California, 92604. Or you can go to our website at iucc.org giving. We're so grateful for your gifts, for the way you work to live and be community. So let us give this morning with generosity, hope, and a belief in love. Lenten God, we thank you for our opportunity to be of service along our journey. We offer these gifts as our commitment to walk the path towards the cross, to follow Jesus along the way, and to journey together as your church. Grateful for the generosity of your people, we give in gratitude to you. Amen. And now a reading from Luke chapter 4. Jesus full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command the stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. Forty days and forty nights. A journey into the wilderness. Hungry for something more than food. Jesus went out to search his soul. Tempted by the stuff of this world, he searched deeply. And he found something more. 
a 40-day journey into the wilderness, a 40-day journey of the soul. That's what we've embarked upon. That's what Lent is. A 40-day fast. Jesus sacrificed food. Christians long fasted from meat, from fat, from alcohol. We often talk of Lent as a time for sacrifice because of this. We choose, then, things to give up. Eleven years ago, I gave up meat for Lent, and I've never looked back. Oftentimes, though, my 40-day fast couldn't end fast enough. Of course, like so many, I've often chosen to see Lent as a time to take something on, a spiritual practice, an intention, sometimes even a theological perspective. We all talk about last year because it was the lentiest Lent of all. We gave up so much and it lasted way more than 40 days. Hey, did you ever wonder about the whole 40-day thing and then maybe question the fact that Lent starts on Ash Wednesday and it ends the Saturday before Easter? And did you ever add it up and realize that it's actually 46 days? But Jesus only fasted for 40 days, and we're supposed to do the same, right? Well, get this. Maybe you already know it, but the tradition says that you get Sundays off. Because, of course, we get a Sabbath, and every Sunday is a remembrance of Resurrection Day. I kind of like that idea, that we always get a chance to break the fast, to celebrate life again. There's something about a little Easter along the way. That being said, though, we're going to observe Lent on Sundays, but you don't necessarily need to fast from food. I do want you to think about what sustains you. Perhaps instead of taking away something, we could add something as we journey the Lenten road together. This year, we're not heading out to an actual wilderness. We're not retreating into a place like Jesus did. We're going to take pause and think about the wilderness we're already living in. The wild ride we've been on, we're recognizing that most of us haven't journeyed anywhere in quite a long time. And yet we're most definitely on a journey. A journey inside. After all, that's the only place we can go this year. For almost a full year, we've been stuck inside, forced to see the world in an entirely different way than we're used to. Talk about sacrifice. Man, I love to travel. I pack my kids up and pop them on a plane, and we go anywhere our frequent flyer miles will take us. But not this year. The only place we've journeyed is inside. So maybe that's where our journey is. Inside. Inside our homes. Inside our hearts. Inside our minds. Inside our souls. To be honest... That's what I think Jesus did too. Oh, he may have been outside in a wilderness, but he journeyed inside to his own wilderness, the wild places in him. He had to wrestle with his own demons. And while I think that's true, no, I do not take it literally. I'm certain that he was wrestling with forces within. He needed to look for sustenance that was more fulfilling than the stuff we put in our mouths. He had to ask himself, what would really sustain him? What would give him life? So maybe he didn't wrestle any real demons, but oh, he was likely wrestling demons inside. I suppose in so many ways we've had to ask ourselves these same questions. What really matters? What really sustains us? We can live without going out to eat. We can live without seeing our family. We can live without going to church. We've had to look at these walls that contain us and creatively seek sustenance within them, even as we have intentionally reached out beyond them, connecting in creative ways. Jesus had to look beyond the norm to be nourished, too. He had to journey inside. So while Lent is the beginning of a journey, in so many ways it's an extension of the one we've been on, this journey inside. So it only makes sense then that we should recognize it, 
and even embrace it. You know, they say you have to embrace the hard things to get through them. Well, I don't know about embracing them. But in this case, I think we should at least name them. We can't ignore them. Yes, this is a journey inside. We're literally inside. So since that's where our Lenten journey is taking place, let's do what we've done every week for almost a whole year and make our homes God's home. We create church where we are. So I want to invite you to begin this journey inside by looking around you and creating an altar of sorts, carving out a space inside and making it your intentional holy space for the next six weeks. Who knows, maybe like my practice 11 years ago, you'll become so transformed by your Lenten experience that you'll extend this far beyond the next 41 days. But for now, let's just start with Lent. Each week we'll gather at our respective altars and create holy space together. Here I stand at the altar that you're most familiar with, but your altar is where you are journeying inside at your home. And so make it for you with the stuff you have inside your home. Since the color of this season is purple, perhaps you can find some purple cloth, a tablecloth, maybe even a placemat, a blanket will do. You could create it with paper if you needed to, Maybe you could color it or paint it. The more creative, the better. But simple is fine. Maybe you find a purple flower or some ribbon. And if you don't have it right now, that's okay. When you see it, you'll know you found it. And then you can bring it to your holy space. If you saw on Wednesday, you'll know that I started this season with you, with Ash. Ashes from the palms of years past, a reminder of our mortality, a reminder of this gift of life. It is from dust that we have come, and it is to dust that we shall return one day. Our Lenten journey, a journey within our journey. Today I'm going to place a stone. You might have one inside your home already. If not, you can easily find one just outside and bring it in. So much of our journey inside is about recognizing how the places outside connect back inside. The question for us is, how does the world outside of ourselves affect the world inside ourselves? How do we connect both inside and out? So think about the literal outside places and things, and then think metaphorically, spiritually even. Stones are incredibly symbolic. They can be used as weapons. Think about it, the concept of stoning, punished by thrown rocks. Or think about stumbling blocks, stones that block our paths or make us trip up and fall down. The scripture this morning gives us a taunting Satan Imagine this devilish character picking up the stone and tossing it right at Jesus. If you're really a son of God, then turn the stone into bread. Well, Jesus didn't bite. He didn't magically turn the rock to bread. But I think he did transform it, or maybe it transformed him. Because the rock, the stumbling block, the stone that was used to taunt him, could have been used to kill him, certainly was intended to trip him up, but ultimately led him deeper. One does not live by bread alone. Maybe it's the stuff that trips us up, the stuff that hurts us, that teaches us the most. Now let me be clear, I do not think that God puts stones on our path so that what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. That is not my theology. But I do think we can learn from painful experiences, the rocky roads, when we pause to take the time to examine them, to bring them inside, to hold them close, they can feed us. Now, those stones have some negative imagery attached to them. They also have strong biblical imagery that is positive as well. Think about it. 
Jesus renamed Simon Peter, Petros, the rock. For some, he then becomes the cornerstone of the church. And a cornerstone, well, it's the guiding force for an entire building, perhaps an entire movement. Incredibly important. Stable, strong, this rock. So I wonder about the stones in our lives, the rough places, the jagged edges. I wonder what happens when we bring the stones inside or we recognize the ones that are already there. What if we embrace them or at least face them the way Jesus faced his demon? What if by giving them a place at our table, they stop working against us? Maybe they can be transformed into something that can actually sustain us, even ground us and give us strength. So think about your stone. Bring it to the altar. Hold it in your hand. Feel the weight of it. And then set it down. Let it be. Its heaviness is there. Just like the heaviness of our world. We won't ignore it, but we also won't give it more power than it deserves. Jesus didn't ignore the demon that shows up in his wilderness. No, he faces it. And rather than end up bashed against the stone, Jesus doesn't feed the demon. The demon gives up and leaves because Jesus is not tempted, nor is he afraid. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't have fears or blame ourselves when we do. But it means that there's a place in our lives for heavy, hard, scary, and fearful stuff, and we can bring it all to God. And maybe if and when we do, we might find ourselves transformed because we chose not to ignore it, but we let it sit at our table. And after all, let's be honest, it's already there. Ignoring it doesn't make it go away. Sometimes it feeds us in the ways that we hadn't intended. But since it's already there, let's not brush it into the darkness, but bring it into the light. Acknowledge its presence among us. And by bringing it into our holy space, we let God begin to work at healing while we do the same. As it happens, my stone came from Tom Silk's garden. I visited him with ashes on Wednesday, and he gifted me a stone. It's purple, the color of Lent, and on it, it says, Wisdom. Wisdom. May our stones bring us wisdom. The journey inside begins. Amen. And so, brothers and sisters, siblings in Christ, go out into a world broken and hurting. Go inward into a world that's often broken and hurting too. And sit with the stones, the pain, and look for the healing, the hope. I know that wisdom waits to guide us deeper along the journey of our souls. Amen.